Well, th thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to come to Montana and see by the scenery why so many people come here. And so I'm happy to recommend that people who are thinking about moving to Idaho should just keep going <laughs> and come to Idaho because we really have enough people in Idaho. But I, I'm thrilled to be here and talk about poultry. And I'm going to be taking kind of a 30,000 foot view of integrating because that's how you have to look at poultry and any operation that you put into a farm or into your marketing plan or even into your community. You have to kind of take the big view and say, how does this fit? So I'm gonna take you through, uh, through my presentation here. I please ask questions if you have them, while you, while you have them. And uh, I'm gonna be covering a lot of topics. So if you have a question about one thing in particular, I wanna make sure I address that. Sure, I operate here. There we go. So in uh, 1915, almost a hundred years ago, my grandfather came to what was then recognized as the frontier of America, which were the big irrigation projects of the interior west. And while this is not a picture of him in particular, it's certainly from the Boise project, a massive irrigation project, because we live in a desert. And without water, if you've ever driven through Boise, it looks green and lush, but if you look to the south, it's, it's a desert. We get 12 inches a year, and currently we're, we're about two thirds of what we need to have. So these irrigation projects drew my, drew, drew my grandfather. They're on a massive scale. This is the ditch that actually runs through Boise. Of course, this is in, 19, in 1898. But this drew my family to the, to the Treasure Valley of Idaho. And so when my grandparents came, they raised chickens, they raised turkeys and geese, they sold eggs, they, they raised a variety of things, sugar beets, onions, potatoes, alfalfa seed, clover seed, all sorts of different things. They had a big garden, and they really were very, very diversified. And so we started changing, though. We ate like this. This is a picture from 1951 of a family in, I believe, uh, Pittsburgh. And this is how we ate. This is the family's food for a year. And so imagine in 1961 when my father said, after my grandparents had died, we're moving to a new farm. We are going to be modern farmers. And so thus began my journey into the age of what I'm going to call ignorance. Because when my father said, we're moving to a new farm, we're going to leave behind all that your grandfather created, he didn't say this, but this is what they did. They left behind the cool house, the cool barn, all that diversity. He said, we are modern farmers. And I remember at the age of six, in 1961, I asked him, well, aren't we going to take the chickens? And it's not that I had any particular allegiance to the chickens. In fact, I was probably a very worthless child. <laughs> but I wondered why the chickens weren't coming with us. And he said, we are modern farmers. We're going to buy what we need in town, and we're going to farm what we do well. I thought, okay, no, whatever. And so we began this <coughs> slow drift, both in agriculture and food, from being very diversified, from knowing a lot, from having a lot of skills, into not knowing very much about our food and how to grow it. And so we moved from this, lots of whole foods there. You had to know a lot to cook this way. And in some cases, if you started with a live chicken, you had to know how to kill it, how to pluck it, how to gut it, how to use all the parts, how to cook it, how to cut it up. You had to know everything. So this age of ignorance began very slowly after World War II, and we moved from that. And in many ways, it was because of convenience, but we started forgetting things. We started becoming ignorant. 
And from an agricultural standpoint, it became very easy to just open up a fertilizer bag and spread it. Who needed to know how to manage the landscape to eliminate pests when you could use a pesticide? Who needed to know how to rotate crops or have the right vegetation management using livestock if you could use a spray? So every time we moved to a new place, to our modern world, we forgot things. And even though we moved a mile away, to bare ground where we built a new house, a very modest three-bedroom ranch, a machine shed, some loafing sheds for the cows. We left behind an entire bank of knowledge, which only now you guys are representing this new relearning and reawakening from the age of ignorance. And so you can imagine my surprise. Well, this was this is how we're measuring progress now. We have an entire generation who really doesn't know how to cook because the generation before them didn't know either. So this was the environment that I was raised in. I was raised on a farm, and yet I knew nothing. We knew how to do what we did well, but we didn't know a lot. And so you can imagine my surprise when in 1989, I had uh, I resigned a commission in the Marine Corps, and I came back to Idaho because, well, I didn't like living in the South and in the East or overseas. And I was underemployed, let's say. I wasn't quite unemployed, <laughs> but it was really darn close. I had a couple of part-time jobs. And in my mid-30s, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I could keep these two part-time jobs. And, you know, I was a ranch sitter for these hobby ranchers. And I had a job at the local sheriff's dispatching office. And, you know, I just was going nowhere very quickly. And so imagine my surprise when I was at a party and my, some friends of mine gave me a seed catalog. And this is a seed catalog from a, a firm that's no longer in business. But at the same time that Garden City Seeds was created right here, there were lots of little seed companies around the country who were trying to reverse this age of ignorance by keeping the seeds a weird thing. And so I saw this seed catalog and I said, I don't know what arugula is. I have no idea what kale is. And who knew there's broccoli that's chartreuse? <laughs> Who knew that? And lettuce that has speckles on it? What's that about? And I might as well have been hit with a two by four because I thought, why is this diversity that's in a seed catalog not in the stores? I didn't have an answer for that. And so I thought, you know, I'm virtually unemployed. Why not? Why not grow this great sounding produce and sell it to my neighbors? Now realize that I was six miles on this ranch from a town of 50 people, <laughs> which was then 50 miles from Boise. So uh, without any thought of marketing, I bought a lot of different seeds, stuff I'd never eaten before in my life, and I started planting. And you know, this age of ignorance caught up with me because I didn't know how to plant anything. You know, we were farmers. We had 120 acres. We planted with planters, and my mother had a few tomato plants, and that was about it. So if the seed catalog said three inches apart, half an inch deep, I was out there with a the ruler. So I had this great quarter acre garden, so probably the best soil on the planet, and about uh, June 1st, it all started looking good and, and started looking like I ought to pick it, and it occurred to me I didn't have much of a plan. In fact, I had no plan because I had a few chickens and I could easily sell the eggs. That was not a problem. But those weird vegetables, let me tell you, people in ranch country, <laughs> they want white potatoes, <laughs> they want head lettuce, they want what's familiar. And here I was growing all these wacky things. And I'm like, well, based on my one test case of saying I have this stuff and getting that one answer, I thought, i got to do something different. So fortunately, fortunately, 
the downtown Boise Farmers Market was on the news that very night. Thank you, God. <laughs> and I thought, I've never been to a farmer's market before, but this is me. I have to go to this market in downtown Boise. So I went to Albertsons, looked at their lettuce, which was not anything like mine, and thought, you know, I'm not using chemicals, so it ought to be more expensive. And it looks better than this, so it ought to be more expensive. So if Albertsons prices were at 60 cents a head, I was at 75. And I went to Albertsons and saw how they displayed things, and I went to the farmer's market. I have a picture. Here we are, 1989, and there I am with a pretty darn pathetic display <laughs> of lettuce. I wouldn't buy a used car from me. I wouldn't <laughs> buy anything from me. But this is how we started. I took 35 heads of lettuce. I sold them all. Made 27 bucks. I was ecstatic. But the thing, it wasn't that that hooked me on dealing with the customers directly. It was because the next week, people came back and said, what are you going to have the rest of the season? That's better than anything we can get in the supermarket. What else will you have? And so that began this journey of listening to the customer. And when they said, we want chicken, we want grass-fed lamb, we want this, we want that, I started to figure out how I could make that happen. Yeah, pathetic. <laughs> but I'm really lucky I have this photo. So I, a couple of years later, I had inherited a small amount of money, and so I bought a farm 20, only 20 miles from Boise. And I actually bought the farm because of the cool barn, which was very much like my grandfather's. And so I'm going to show you kind of the my picture of how things fit together. Because I think it's really hard to say, I want to raise chickens and you have a blank landscape. That's really hard. I like to think of things as an ecosystem. In the temperate zone that we have, what is in the landscape? And how can I emulate it a little bit? I mean, I'm, I know I'm manipulating it, but how can I make things work together? And I did not know at the time that my goal was to become lazier and lazier. That's my goal, <laughs> is to have the animals, have the landscape, have it do the work. And so I feel my job is to think about the entire picture and how I can make this work, double duty, triple duty, to benefit the whole. And it takes years, and I'm never going to be done. But in thinking about it as an ecosystem, you kind of put together some components. So I have sheep. That's my large herbivore on the landscape. So they eat grass. I'm a grass farmer, really. I raise a lot of grass. But not just grass, grass. I have a diversity, which not only benefits the sheep, but it benefits the microorganisms and benefits the pollinators. I don't have to mow. So if you have a mower and you use your mower, you're the large herbivore. <laughs> and um, the oil companies are a big herbivore. So I'm trying not to use fossil fuel. I'm moving from a, for those of you who are sheep people, um, this you know, picture of a fence may not be that interesting to you, except it shows that I'm moving to a hair sheep. And this particular sheep here is losing her wool and so I won't have to shear. I'm trying to get lazier and lazier. <laughs> That's my goal. And so I do sell grass-fed lamb. And I started out growing, I think, in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem, you always have some bare ground that's always being used for something. I used to grow a lot of vegetable crops. Now I'm primarily livestock. But I think a wonderful way to look at a farm is how you integrate pastures and cropping. Um, a few years ago at the Washington Tilth Conference, uh, a researcher from Canada suggested that there should be five years of crops, and, or five years of pasture and two years of crops to build the soil, to keep the nutrient cycle going. And so I think it's really intriguing to think about how we rotate crops and using livestock in the landscape to, to benefit the fertility of the soil and the health of the crop. So, in looking at the structures on my farm, 
I like creating little microclimates and using things in lots of different ways. So this is a straw bale greenhouse that we built in 1994. And so in addition to being a lazy person, I also make a lot of work for myself. So I could have put up, I could have put up a, a structure, a greenhouse structure, and I have some. But I'm thinking, wouldn't it be cool to have straw bale? And so uh, we have straw available, and this is kind of a new cutting edge thing at the time. And so uh, we worked a bunch of our friends, lots of friends, into coming and helping us put up this 17 by 19 square uh, uh, straw bale greenhouse. And it's been standing for, what's 1994, times, well, whatever it says, 18 years now. It's not a piano. It uses, it needs some maintenance, but I use it for starting plants in the, in the uh, summer, late summer, I'll plant, I uh, can't tell where I am, I'll plant right in the ground, it will grow, this was last week, so we ate greens all winter long, and we had some really cold weather, uh, it was below zero for a couple of days, it, it just laid down, but it came back, we were eating kale within a couple of weeks after it thawed, and then uh, in a couple weeks, I'll get baby chicks, and I'll put them in this greenhouse, and they will eat it from the ground up. I mean, I will have to give them chicken feed as well, but this place will look like a, you know, a firestorm went through after they're done eating all the weed. They're fertilizing. They're protected in here. I have a little door that they can go out to an enclosed area. And so the structure is benefiting us, benefiting the chickens. I don't have to fertilize, I don't have to weed, excellent. <laughs> we also have a structure like this, um, and at the time I was going to be doing more winter greens, now I use this as more of a sheet structure, but you could also extend your season a lot by, by having things like uh, these winter greens in here. One year I did experiment by having my chickens in here, and what I learned is that foxes can look right through that plastic, <laughs> and they can reach, right? It takes such a tiny little tear to open up the plastic and grab a chicken. And so I'm convinced that this would be really effective if you solid-sided it so that the fox wouldn't like see the chickens and then figure out in a microsecond how to open up the plastic and get in there. But another way of using something for another use, you benefit, the chickens benefit, and uh, you're using a structure. Now I'm using it as a sheep shed. I only have it half covered. And so in the winter, because I, I lamb in uh, December and January, I move the new mothers out to this pasture where this is, and they use this as a shed. And probably in two weeks, I'll get baby tomato plants, and I will plant right into the dirt. Actually, I'll have to chip through the bedding and the straw and the, the hay. So I'll run a drip line, and right where that water is, I'll plant tomatoes. And some years, depending on the season, I can have heirloom tomatoes six weeks before I have them outside, just with no heat, just with a little hoop. So again, I'm using structures in different, in, for two or more purposes. So I do have poultry. These are some of the more, I won't say exotic, but uh, they're not the chickens. I, I raise turkeys occasionally. What I found in listening to my customers is that they really wanted turkeys, and now there are lots of people raising turkeys. So I like turkeys. Sometimes it doesn't work for me to raise them. So I'm happy that there are other farmers who are raising them. What kind of geese? Those are Toulouse uh, Emden crosses. Mm -hmm. And I... I got these for two bucks a piece. You know, this one guy was trying to get rid of geese, so one year I bought for two bucks a piece, big geese. And you know, if you buy them from a hatchery, they're like six, yeah. and today I thought that was a great deal. So for Christmas, there are, there's a huge group of people out there who have a little disposable income who are adventurous food eaters. And those who have a Germanic background really want to, to taste their culture. And so I had a great success selling food for Christmas. Plus, they eat grass, and that's what I'm growing. <laughs> so, double win. Plus, they're cute. They're good citizens. They, 
they talk and they let you know. I mean, no wonder the Romans had them in their walls. Because they they cannot be bought off with a steak like a dog. <laughs> they will let you know when someone's strange is in the driveway. They are absolutely great watchdogs. And they're not mean. These guys aren't. I've heard of these that are, but these guys are these guys are not. And let me tell you, if they're mean, I have a way of getting <laughs> I do have a lane flock. I have about 150 layers, and uh, they have a, a secure place on, on one of the sides of the barn. So these are the these are the layers here. Sorry about the dark picture. And then I have uh, every year I'll I'll run anywhere between 200 and 2,000 meat birds. Really, it depends on my schedule. And this year, I'm, last year I was super busy. This year I'm kind of busy, so I, I may just do a batch of 200. But I like to raise the naked nets, and I've set up my farm so that I'm using existing fences that I can use for sheep and chickens to contain them and, and throw them out in different pastures. It's much more expensive because the sheep don't need the, the little non-climbable fence. They really just need field fence. But the chickens need need that extra security. So I have these guys out here, and then I have four or five other places where I can raise them as chicks and, and send them out into pasture. Do you buy your chicks locally, or do you send for them? I send for them. Um, I, there's a hatchery in Alabama that raises a nice naked neck uh, chick that I really like. It's called S&G Poultry. They also have some other varieties, but I like the naked neck because there are lots of people who are raising Cornish crosses and that's pretty boring in my opinion. So I'm trying to be different, differentiate myself. Um, these guys do really well in the heat. They have 50% yeah. fewer feathers and uh, a feather has to have fat to stick in the skin. And these, without the, the feathers, have no fat under the skin. So if you if you want to roast a chicken and have a nice skin, this is your breed. If you're going to put it in a stew pot, I won't sell it to you because you're wasting the skin. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how large do they finish out? Dress out at? They how, how long, I guess. About five, so five pounds at 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're slower growing. Mm -hmm. Then I also, uh, when I moved to my farm in 1991, I said, I am not going to live somewhere and in 10 years say, gee, I should have planted an orchard. <laughs> so I planted this small orchard and the chickens, and I fenced it in that field fence. And so the chickens roam around in here, and I've used chicken tractors in here. Uh, there's lots of different ways to manipulate the grass that's already growing and, and put chickens into it. I found that chicken tractors just took way too much of my time. I just, I just don't have the time for that. So I'd rather have an area that's fenced and turn them loose. And then lock them up at night. Very important to have something to lock them up, but, but I just don't have time. So do you just have a coop out in the orchard now? Yeah. People always give us stuff, like I have this dog kennel that someone didn't want, and it, you know, it's 10 feet tall and all this. And so it, it, it looks like, um, well, it's not quite clampets, but it's very close. <laughs> and that, you know, people give us stuff and we reuse it. And if I don't use something three or four times before I throw it away, I mean, that piece of wood had better be pretty small before it goes to the bird pile. Uh, so we use, but everybody gets locked up. Um, this little tree down here, we're experimenting with figs. Mm. So it froze back to the ground and it hasn't come back up yet <laughs> this year. I'm thinking of putting it in the Strawbell greenhouse though and, and seeing what it will do there. But I, I want to fence off this area and plant it to a good pasture and have chickens grazing in the area of all these trees. So I'm going to water the trees anyway. I could water, water a little air, larger area and have pasture and let them uh, graze that. We're, uh, I think one part about a farming operation is on farm fertility. And animals give that to you. Animals allow you to do that. And so we have uh, 
one of the most fun things you could do, in my opinion, on a winter day is turn the compost pile. There's just something really great about making compost. We have, uh, so we have a pretty brand new Kubota tractor, this very antique manure spreader, <laughs> which works really well. And we love to do crop circles and stripes and everything. And I can't resist this picture because on the right is where the compost was spread. And on the left, it's good, but it's not, not great. It's not as good. And farms also have, I think ecosystems also have little tiny crops that fill certain niches. And I'm really fascinated by grains. In fact, I was telling uh, Jeff and Tammy last night that I think the frontier for small farms is how to grow chicken feed on the farm and have the chickens harvest it themselves. Now, how can we do that? I'm thinking about it, because I think feed costs is certainly an important cost into a, into a small farm situation, and you can't always get GMO-free feed. In fact, last year for my meat birds, I bought feed from Montana. From Montana, who is that gentleman? Oh, what's their name? They changed. That's Big probably what I can remember. The guy up in the mountain there. Yeah, Montana Flower and Grain. Montana Flower and Grain. Yeah. 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 I mean, that really, that's ridiculous. It was fantastic feed, don't get me wrong. Ridiculous for it to be shipped to Idaho when we're surrounded by grain. But it was GMO free. Certified organic. I'm, not, I'm no longer certified organic because I can't rely on the feed. But how can we incorporate in a small farm situation grains? pulses and other things to, uh, and to, uh, if not have the entire feed, but at least a great supplement of it. You know, this is a, a new area of research, I think, that no one's really looked at. But it's how do you, it's really interests me. So I do trials, mostly, for people. A friend of mine is an organic seed grower, so she always gives me fun seeds to try, and then I start thinking about how I can spin this into chickens or, or other things. So last year I grew this orca bean and a, a tiger's eye bean for her. And then uh, my newest fun project is polenta. And so the polenta corn that, that wasn't any good, I just throw it to the chickens. No shelling, just throw it. So take the husk off so they know what's in there. Chickens don't have the x-ray vision. We wish they did. Or maybe they do, I don't know. But pull the husk back and they eat it right off the cob. As long as they have grit, they can digest these whole grains. But what I've discovered in talking to my farmer's market customers is that there's this great hunger for polenta that's different, for, for grits, for corn. And so uh, I think that's an exciting thing. This is a one, this is Floriani, it's a, an Italian variety. So we're very excited about trying that. And I also uh, do a little bit of grain work. This is red fife, and uh, then to the left are some oats. What we've, in the Treasure Valley of Idaho, have discovered is that we're really just growing a couple of different kinds of grain. And it's mostly so that you can harvest it well, or the Korean market, or whoever's buying it wants it. But there's a great number of bakers <coughs> who want certain kinds of grain. Well, one of the outcomes of having grain for bakers is you have seconds, you have stuff that doesn't make bacon grain, you know, broken, broken kernels and whatnot, which is chicken feed. So Idaho has uh, the National Small Grains Repository, and so you can ask them for literally a very small coin envelope of grain. They have thousands of different grains, but they give you like 20 seeds. And from those 20 seeds, it will take you five years to get something you could really plant commercially. So uh, some friends and I have been thinking about, well, what, what grains do we need to multiply out? And so I took a handful of grains for, for three kinds of oats last year and, and moved it up to a quart jar. Modest, but somebody's got to do that work. So I think it's really exciting to think about this as part of my bigger farm. And then we grew uh, some other things. Um, vegetables. I grow seeds. That some of the tomato seed. This is an Italian variety, and I have to share the story with you. My seed friend 
has some foodie friends in Oregon who went to the Slow Food Conference, and they spent some time in Italy, and they, they bit into this tomato in a tourist, in a, in a small town, and they said, this is the best tomato we've ever had. So they quickly spit out the seeds <laughs> into a napkin and smuggled them back. <laughs> maybe, maybe with this being a USDA thing, I shouldn't be. <laughs> but this is years ago, so I hope the amnesty damnesty <laughs> but it's a, uh, so she had asked me to grow the seeds for her every year, this Pomodorini di Pianello, and it's really a magnificent seed, and I think this is part of our responsibility as small landholders to think about that diversity and, and make sure that we're enhancing it, as well as feeding ourselves. Uh, I grew pepper seeds. This is a Basque. We have a lot of Basque folks in our area, so this is a Basque uh, roasting pepper that I grow seeds for. And then we try are trying almonds. Yes, there they are. Mm. Last year, and they made it through the winter, and so we're really excited about these beautiful trees to have almonds. And I think that's another thing we have to think about is how our farms move into the future, a future of perhaps warming temperatures, maybe less water less energy. So we, we can't just say, I want to raise chickens and here's my blank canvas. There's an entire spectrum of events happening around us that we must be cognizant of. So we have very modest equipment. I won't bore you with all this antique stuff, but um, that's my dad's disc, which I <laughs> inherited. I don't, I don't disturb the ground much, but I have a little, I do it a little bit. Um, the one thing I might point out here is this, this structure here. This is a conduit greenhouse, you know, the electrical conduit. Yeah. For very little money, you can put one of these up. I use this as a shed for if I have a ewe and lambs that need just a little extra space to be in in the winter, I put them in there. I raise chickens in there. It's solid-sided. I can do a lot in that. And so all these structures, I try to use different things. And here I am, I've moved uh, from 1989 up until the recent time. This is, I, I sell meat out of coolers. It's kind of boring, but so I try to gussy it up a little bit. But, uh, I sell all of my lambs by the cut at, through the Boise Farmer's Market. I sell chickens, I sell eggs. Um, it's a very successful market. But the catch is always processing, because you can raise almost anything, but if you can't get it processed, you've got a barrier. So this is from uh, the Atlas of the Northwest Resources and Development that Oregon State, oops, go back. Oregon State put out um, in 1951, and this shows a lot of processing across the Northwest, including and I'm guessing this is Missoula? Is that true? Up in you, Missoula? You had it that? right. That's a long, narrow. Where am I? Up. Rest, there you are. Missoula. And what is this? That's Silver Bowl County. Yeah, that's Silver Bowl County. Is that beautiful? Yeah. So that's look beautiful. at how much the little peas are poultry processing. So yeah. look at how much processing there was available here and there and over there and up there. And yeah all through the north there. And in my area, here's where I'm at, imagine the options that you have. Because today, and I, do, I have the USDA map, but not on this, there's, there's hardly anything. Yeah. And, it, and uh, you know, we have customers from all over. In fact, Mickey Gazelle from North Bozeman brought us chicken. That's ridiculous. It is really ridiculous to haul chickens any distance. You're not going to make any money. So uh, this is what we used to have. And so in an effort to have processing, because I'm listening to my customers, uh, it started out with nine business partners. You know, I should have an MBA on how not to run a business. <laughs> yeah. Because nine business partners have 20 points of view. And so it's down, now down to uh, a single business partner. He and his family live in a small town of New Plymouth. I actually live down here in Nampa, and the plant is up here. This is our plant. We uh, <coughs> created in a, in a business 
where we had all used processing for a couple of years, and this it was a big room like this. The killing was done over here, and the packaging over there. We could never get state inspection, and that was our goal. To be able to take chickens to the farmer's market, or to a restaurant, or to a co-op, or anywhere, and sell them at retail. Because you can do a lot to sell things on what I call the black market. I mean, if you're dealing with a person, I, maybe black market is I'm sounding like I'm a crook here, you know, <laughs> smuggling seeds and all this stuff. But, you know, when you talk one to one with an, another private individual, you can do a lot. But once you start entering commerce or advertising, the, the government gets involved. And you just can't expand your market talking one-to-one. -one. You just don't know that many people. So we changed the state law that allows us, if we have a licensed food facility, licensed by the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, you can sell your chickens at retail. And so we've gone from having just a few thousand birds, and right now we're at the 20,000 bird limit. We're right up against it. Please don't get me started on the bewildering array of regulations around poultry, <laughs> except to know that there are tr tremendous barriers to it. It's the cost. This is, the equipment is not cheap. The knowledge to run a plant is immense. The understanding of the regulatory environment, food safety requirements, not that these are necessarily bad things, but they are incredible barriers to just selling a chicken to your neighbor. It, it's uh, really, um, don't get me started, it's really an onerous burden that, that is stopping the local food movement from really advancing. And so uh, a few years ago, uh, we were in business and then we had a competitor who had been operating on a very small scale open up another building, uh, another facility nine miles away from us. So the entire state of Idaho, for, for three or four hundred miles, there's just the two <coughs> of us, and we're nine miles from each other, and we're both state inspectors. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the economics of this. I know Jeff's going to care, carry this further, but there are many reasons to raise pastured poultry, and each of you come to this with your own reasons, and then you have customers who come wanting the product for their own reasons. But there are many people who are going to look at the price and say, hmm. And so, for many people, the competition is at $1.53 a pound. And that's the average. You'll see it for 99 And what are they getting? They're, they're not getting your product, but they're getting something they call chicken. <laughs> which I would worry about. I'm charging four seventy-five dollars a chicken. Because that's really what I feel I need. And I'm not getting rich, let me assure you. You know, if, you, if I can make a couple bucks a chicken, so if I'm only raising 200 chickens, and I'm only making $2 a chicken, that's four hundred. It really makes no sense whatsoever for me to raise chickens, really. Except that they fit into my ecosystem. But you've got the chick, you've got the feed, you've got the butcher feed, and so right away, you're at 288. That's just plain and simple. You've got a very expensive product there, and you haven't accounted for your time, or the transportation, or building that fence. Even if you amortize it over years, you haven't accounted for that. So you have to be looking at it as providing a different product to a different audience. So our, some of our growers were mostly all at 475, 450. Some of the organic folks are at five and a quarter a pound for a whole chicken, and three fifty at wholesale. So as a processor, I'm looking at how to build market for some of my customers, and also how to encourage people to buy. I mean, I'm selling. I will sell you a, a twenty dollar chicken, and for some people, it's a heart attack. They're like, what? How is that possible? So we're recommending people cut them up. Remember that age of ignorance, people don't know how to cut up chicken. And so they want the boneless, skinless breasts. They want the thighs and the wings and all that. And so me as a processor, I'll cut them up for you. And then you can sell all those parts at a higher margin than you can the whole chicken. I, I also want to, to talk a little bit about a poultry operation in the bigger picture of the local food system. 
and I want to integrate it into the community. So 10 years ago, well, let's see, 2001, Ken Meter, who has done a study in this area, in the five counties of western Montana, he produced this report called Finding Food in Farm Country. And he took a little section of southeastern south, uh, uh, Minnesota, and he looked at how money moves, how, what the farming and what the food economy looks like when you put them together. And what he found was that that area was losing money. You know, all the farmers seemed to be making money, but all the food that was eaten by the residents was being brought in, and so all that money was leaving. And much of the money the farmers were making was coming in from, from government subsidies. And he said, you know, all in all, this region, which is raising a lot of food, is not feeding its people well, and the wealth is draining away. And I was blown away. It was like I had been hit by a two by four because I had never really thought about how food and agriculture really relate in the community because we don't talk about it that way. And so I'll go uh, point to this. This came out uh, two years ago. He did a study of Western Montana local food and food economy. And what he found there is that in red, you add the loss of the farm economy to the consumer dollars that leave in this area is losing wealth. Most areas of the United States are losing wealth because we're not producing the food we eat and the food that we do grow leaves. But that really woke me up and so I started thinking about, well, how do all these little local food pieces fit into this? And what does the future portend for us? So I just, I, I took a look at the Ag Census and said, okay, well, what about this county? Because I don't know much about this county. So we have some pretty average, uh, in fact, the average size of farms has gone down since 1954. But the size, the numbers remain about the same. But I take some crops, and, and this is consistent across the United States, that the local food that we eat has diminished or disappeared or, or is in just little pockets, and we're raising many crops at a huge scale, and it's all going out. And so uh, you can see that, so let's say strawberries. This county in 1954 grew 96 acres, and there were a lot of farms. And so uh, in our area, this is pretty consistent that you know it's about an acre of strawberries is what the average farm can manage, and that's probably true. But today it's shrunk to one. And you probably know, if you're from this area, who that one person is. <laughs> and, there, and this is the Ag Census data. So, you know, there could be people who don't fill it out. I'm a big pusher of the Ag Census because I love these numbers. <laughs> and if they ain't there, I don't know. But you could just see all these foods that we eat have shrunk. And then, you know, I didn't even go into the commodity crops because you know they're held by fewer and fewer people on bigger and bigger acreages. So I took a look at the poultry. So in 2007, poultry of any kind, uh, 163 farms had some, and you can see that most people had from one to 49 layers. There were only 188 broilers that, that came to the attention of ag census, and there's probably many more, but people who reported that and 53 turkeys. And let me tell you, that's not much food to, to go through the valley here. Hi, Dan. Hi, how are you? Good. And so I compared that to 1954. There were 77,000 layers in this county that were reported in 1954 and only 2,600 today. We're not losing. And this is typical across the country. Also, there were a lot of broilers, a lot of turkeys, and that has a lot to do with processing. So I look at these numbers as saying, what's the potential? I mean, if I go back to the Ag Census and say, can an area grow this food? I go to the Ag Census and say, was it done 50 years ago, 60 years ago? And if it has, that's potential for the future. It's enormous potential. We can do it again. 
We are going to walk away from this age of ignorance and have to learn it again. But it will be expensive in some cases. It will take a lot of, of knowledge, both on, on the producer's side as well as the consumer's. But we can do this. So I just want to point out a couple of resources here. Greener Rates and Ham, uh, produced by the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists about six years ago. A great resource in looking at why you should have pasture poultry, if you're not familiar with it. And then, uh, I can't say enough good things about the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association. Uh, they have a listserv that every day has topics of great interest. <coughs> and they have this great book about raising poultry. There's, when you integrate a poultry operation into something else, you, I could sit up here and tell you how I do it, but my operation is very different from everyone else's. So integrating it into what you're doing is probably the key. And I recommend, let me not say stealing ideas, but certainly going to people who are doing the work and saying, that's a great idea that I could use on my farm, and I will, I will change my farm or I'll add this idea so that I'm more successful. I'm a great stealer of ideas. I love that. <laughs> and I, I would also argue that you have a unique responsibility as being involved in the local food movement, providing local food to people. And that is to have a voice in policy and be active in organizations that can move everyone's agenda forward. Because trust me, I used to think that when I had my farm, I could do it all by myself. And then I realized I need a market with a lot of farmers doing good things, so I have a big market to go to and attracting a lot of customers. I need processing that has a lot of customers and a lot of support. I need seeds that are grown by a lot of different people. I need to integrate myself into the bigger world to be successful. Yeah, I have my own little operation, but I have to be part of the bigger community. And unless you, your voice is heard through organizations or other policy work, you're going to be out there by yourself, and the processing will go away. The support you have in growing seeds or, or keeping birds will go away as well. So these are some of the organizations I work with. We have a new farmers market in Boise. I also uh, work with the Treasure Valley Food Coalition, we're a local food system, and uh, we have a project this year called Tomato Independence Project, which I have to plug a little bit because we are ending the tyranny of the tasteless tomato. <laughs> So, you know, we're just, you could end the, the tyranny of the tasteless chicken, too, because there's so much tastelessness that this age of ignorance has brought us that we can bring it back. And I also encourage you to be open to farm tours. I work with the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. They have farm tours almost every year. Open your farm. Let people come. You cannot believe the number of consumers who come back to me. I don't recognize them. They say, you know, I saw your farm a few years ago. It inspired me. It inspired my son or whatever. Now they're this loyal customer. It always pays for itself to be open to the public, to be transparent about what you do and why you do it. It always pays for itself. And so finally, you say, well, J.D., you told us that it's hard work, uh, there's a lot of things to do, and you're not going to make any money. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> but I try to integrate what I'm doing into my life as well. And, you know, someone asked me the other day why, I, why I'm involved in farming, and I said, it's because I get to see a miracle every single day. Sometimes I don't have to look very hard to find the miracles, but there are very few professions where you can say, I get to see a miracle today. I get to be part of this great, wonderful impulse of local food and, and the natural world. This is worth doing all by itself. Plus, I get to eat really well. <laughs> so I thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. I'm looking at the, those numbers that you put up for 
1954 versus 07, and it just screams why. Has anybody done a study on what has occurred over that 30, 40 yeah, years? Yeah, you know, um, I have a, a whole other presentation on this. The, what happened after World War II? Well, as I mentioned, we became modern. Heck, we were going to the moon. I was promised a jet pack, which I'm still waiting for. <laughs> and so there was this whole impulse to be modern. We had the interstate highway system, which replaced rails. And so if you're shipping fresh produce, you cannot wait for a train. But you can put it on a truck. It can be there by tomorrow. You had the, the housewife who or women in the workforce who stayed in the workforce, and when you are in working, you demand a little bit of convenience. Plus, you have all these convenience foods which came out of feeding the troops in World War II, and it became cool to have something you opened up, put in the oven, and 30 minutes later, you have this TV dinner. So there's a convenience aspect of it. You have the rail system being replaced by interstate highway. You have more disposable income to afford these conveniences. There's, uh, you have the GI Bill, which all these World War II veterans came out, they could go to college. And so the universities helped this too because they started looking at things in a very narrow focus. They said, here's a weed, how, here's how we're gonna control it. Here's the chemical. So son comes back to the farm and says, Dad, Throw away all that knowledge, 10,000 years of cultural knowledge on how we control weeds. We're going to use this chemical because we are modern. This is what everyone else is doing. And so I know being raised in a farming area, my dad went to coffee every day at 9.30. <laughs> every day. No women, just the guy. And they talked, uh, until I was a certain age, I'd go, and these guys were gossiping about, oh, have you seen those weeds? Are you kidding? Boy, those beets don't look very good. They should do this and this and this. So there was a great deal of peer pressure, too. So, and, and then you had uh, consolidation. For economic reasons, people found it easier to grow more and more of one thing than to di diversify. So there's a lot of reasons, but that's kind of our agricultural history since 19. And we are now, and that's the age of ignorance. We've got all that stuff. Now we're relearning it. You guys are the pioneers of this. One huge difference here, of course, was in 54, uh, a lot of the food from here was serving the mines in Butte. And as the mines declined, those 60,000 people in Butte went down to less than 20,000. And uh, notice the strawberries. The old Bulgarians, and, and Jackie and I served in Bulgaria, uh, both before and after the fall of communism, and that was that uh, they came here to help build courthouses, Serbians, Italians, and Bulgarians. Well, then, when the courthouses were built in the 20s, then they helped build uh, irrigation canals, which you could see the same thing in Bulgaria, but you know, hundreds of years older. And then, uh, most of them were bachelors, so they became vegetable farmers here. And they could get the Indians to come down and pick strawberries and do the handwork. When the Indians started getting checks, they no longer came. And there wasn't any young people would try for a while, but they could no longer get dependable labor. And that's a problem to this day, which is why we have the Mexican visa, so that uh, people can come up every year and do work that teenagers won't touch anymore. But that's why strawberries went from 96 acres down to one. And it is kind of true with the other things, too. Uh, there was an interesting study uh, as an uh, alternative agriculture specialist for Extension Service until I retired. Of course, I'm still on the board of NCAT. And uh, in 1886, there were 250 different enterprises pro uh, processing agriculture products. There were 50 breweries, about 50 slaughterhouses, about 50 uh, flour mills, and uh, 20 canneries and so on like that. And when Henry Bond did the study in 1986, there were no breweries left. There were a few little ones coming back. There was one flour mill in Great Falls. There were nothing but a few country slaughterhouses left. And all the way, and there were no canneries left. And part of that was that nobody wanted to do that labor anymore. And you could not find anybody um, 
you go down here and you try to find a kid that'll change pipes. It's impossible. I hear you. That's why there's all these yeah. pivots and, and uh, wheel lines. Yeah, so there's a lot of factors that play into that, but I'm really heartened by the craft brewery uh, impulse in which... Yeah, that's the return we're seeing in what you're talking about. It's interesting because the first we're really pushing farm to school, uh, farm to table, all that sort of thing. But, uh, and there are a few stalwart producers, and you'll meet one of them this afternoon. And as I told them when I, I came back here, when I came here as a young county agent in 64, there were 400 dairies in the Valley County and seven creameries. Now there are five dairies. There's one organic creamery at uh, Victor. Otherwise, the milk from here used to go to Bozeman. Now it goes to Salt Lake City. And so that every uh, jug of milk has a 1,200-mile uh, uh, round trip. But my favorite is to talk about the 3,000-mile steak. We got calves that are just born again yester uh, yesterday, but if a mile from Safeway here, there is a calf born. It goes from here when it's about 500 pounds to Colorado to be fed, goes to Nebraska to be finished, goes to Iowa to be butchered, goes to Minneapolis to be broken down in a box, and it comes back to Safeway. From a mile away where it is born, it travels 3,000 miles to be home again. And, and think of the ignorance that the consumer has mm -hmm. of the travel, of the fossil fuel involved in that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's worth telling the, the local food story of how we can have better health through more local food, we can support our local economy, we can uh, be, we can understand how to, how to cook, we can have more community. There's a lot of benefits, but there's a lot to get that going. Yes, ma'am. How many people do you have? Do you have anybody there to work on your place, or do you do it yourself? Or um, I mean, how many people operate your place? Is it just, I mean, just me, you by yourself? Me and my partner, part-time. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and so we both do a little out, you know, off our, we call it OFI, off-farm income. Because right. That's the reality of the local food movement is you've got to have off-farm mm -hmm. income. I, I told you I'd try to be as lazy as possible. Right. So uh, <laughs> during lambing, I am there, and I have to be there, or or I know the wind up that I have to be there. But I try to set it up so that I don't have to. I, I have a lot of pieces, and I hope they work together, and I'm there to intervene at certain points. And you know, we have to irrigate. Yeah. You and your partner can basically do right. everything on right. your own. You don't have to bring in right. a no, lot of help. That's the labor issue. Kill me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the floor is yours. We've exhausted the subject. <laughs> yeah, we have a little bit of a break, so folks can get up and get some coffee. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.